It's pretty hard to follow ET, so I'll see what I can do. Uh, so the presentation I'll be talking about is uh, understanding amplifiers. It's more the, uh, the radio side of software-defined radio. Um, when uh, people talk about communicating further, uh, you know, it, it, this has been going on since voice communication. There's actually still competitions today by the International Voice Criers Association where people want to shout the furthest distance. And the loudest guy that won last year was 112 decibels, but still it can only be understood at about 100 meters. And uh, you know, RF can actually do much better. So where are amplifiers used in um, SDR designs? It's everything from the uh, LNAs, the gain blocks, the power amplifiers. The most uh, power amplifiers actually have a multi-gain stages to, to get things up from the, uh, the DAC and the IQ mod up to, um, you know, it's uh, multiple watts or multiple hundreds of milliwatts. Um, and each of these kinds of things have a, a different um, requirement and uh, trade-offs to be made in them. Uh, and most of the time, you know, it's the uh, RF amplifiers are kind of the op amps of the RF world. I'm assuming most people have uh, some background in like undergrad electrical engineering where they took like a circuits one, circuits two class where they have, you know, those um, teepees laid over on their sides. Um, and you know, usually RF amplifiers have a fixed gain, usually specified in dB and are 50 ohms. And uh, typically they're uh, powered from the, uh, the output side right here. So this is actually where the power comes in and, and provides power to the output. It doesn't actually have a separate power like a, uh, an op amp would. And some key specifications we'll be talking about are like IP3, uh, noise figure, and power consumption. So RF amplifiers, op amps, uh, you know, typically RF amplifiers are 50 ohms specified, and power handling is like a one P1 dB number, as opposed to op amps, which are high input impedance and low output impedance, and need like uh, lots of R's and C's around them to actually set the gain. And uh, typically RF amps have no uh, DC specs on them where op amps actually would. So in terms of impedance matching and maximum power transfer, that's actually what we want to do. So like I said, um, if we have a 50 ohm uh, source over here that's our uh, DAC or ADC or our, our output of our mixer, what kind of load do we need to get do, so that we have the maximum power transfer based on you know this power over here. And if we plot this out with various Rs, we see that the math tells us is like, okay, well our maximum power transfer here is when our exactly at 50 ohms. So when our input um, impedance matches our output impedance, we get maximum power transfer. That's why most antennas are 50 ohms. That's why most syst like RF systems are 50 ohms. Um, I'm not going to get into like impedance matching and these kinds of things because there lo there's lots of amplifiers or ADCs or DACs or mixers that are 200 ohms or 100 ohms or, or these kinds of things. And that's usually handled by the, uh, the RF hardware engineer. So amplifier specifications are kind of a trade-off between distortion, noise, and power consumption. So we're just kind of looking at distortion. If we have uh, two signals, like F1 and F2, coming in through an amplifier, it'll produce two fundamentals. It'll also produce two harmonics. It'll also produce second order harmonics, like F1, F2 minus F1, and F1 plus F2. And it'll also produce third order harmonics, and fourth order harmonics, and fifth order harmonics, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, usually the, uh, the, the Second harmonics are pretty easy to filter out because they're uh, far away from your signal of interest. The second order intermod products are usually, again, pretty easy to, to uh, get rid of because they're far, far away from your signals of interest. It's those third order um, products that are actually difficult because they actually are super close to your signal of interest. And we'll actually like talk a little bit about kind of what they do and where they come from. And so typically what this is measured in is IMD3. And it, what that's known as in a DBC number. So it's the difference between the, your uh, power at your fundamental piece and your actually inner, your, your, the level of your intermod product here. So if we, the way we test that typically is we have like two uh, absolutely perfect sine waves and we put those in through a low pass filter. We combine them so we have two perfectly good uh, signals 
And then we put that through our device under test, and, uh, and then we measure these, uh, where these intermod products actually show up. And we measure that usually on test equipment, or if your SDR is capable enough and accurate enough, you, will, you can measure it on your SDR. You uh, want to make sure that your SD, the, the equipment you're using to measure it will also have intermod products. So you want to make sure the limit of your system is your test equipment, not the device under test, or the, the device under test is the, lim the limit, not your uh, test equipment. So just kind of a uh, um, uh, flipbook animation. So if, if we think of our um, two fundamentals and our IMDB products down at the bottom, as our fundamental goes up, we can actually see that the, the distortion products actually go up higher. So these lines on the side were the fundamental power, and these long li lines on the side were our distortion products. And so if we plot that out based on IP3 versus output power, we can see the fundamental, we can see the inner mods, we can plot a, uh, a best fit line of a slope of one and a slope of three, and then we intercept that, and uh, that's what's known as our IP3 number which is the intercept of the fundamental and inner mods. So the IP3 is just this, uh, can be input referred or output referred, and uh, it's basically the IM, the intermod products change at 3 dB for every 1 dB of change in the fundamental. And uh, what that typically means in receivers is uh, if we have our signal of interest like here, all of these signals will actually have intermod products not just the tones, so uh, on the uh, test side, we like to test with tones because it's nice and it's mathematically precise. When you actually have real systems, you have wide bandwidth devices and everything looks like a, a, um, at an FFT. It is all in the Fourier domain, it all folds back and it can cause all kinds of intermod products you may not be aware of, including things that, you know, over here, it looks like it's fine, but this signal here and this signal here will actually cause an intermod product and uh, cause you problems. Um, so what a lot of people are doing in receivers now is they're actually kind of moving away from uh, talking about IMDB and, and going to what a, a new spec called uh, noise power ratio, where they actually take a Gaussian noise signal that is the entire bandwidth of your system, put a notch filter in it where your signal of interest is, and then see what the noise floor of that notch is. And what that allows is that if there's any mixing products that fall into your signal of interest, it'll increase this noise floor. And a lot of the satellite comms guys um, are starting to move to this as their figure of metric because they want to see actually what um, uh, dynamic range they have in their signal, no matter what folds back, no matter where it comes from. And so we're doing a lot of things like this too. It becomes rather difficult when you want to create a six gigahertz wide signal with a, a two megahertz notch in it. And uh, we're working a lot with uh, test equipment manufacturers to be able to do that. But uh, it's working. Uh, so you know, a lot of the, uh, the older parts that we make will still have like uh, output power in IP3 numbers and won't actually have that uh, NSF data in it. So output swing. Uh, and the, the power numbers, the P1 number. So typically, when a, uh, an amplifier is increased in power, if this is your power in and this is your power out, uh, there'll be some gain here. So for, if you put in uh, 1 dB, you'll get 10 dB out, and if you put in 2 dB, you'll get 11 dB out. But at some point in time, the, the amplifier is gonna saturate. And uh, then you end up, end up basically with this compression. And the wattage is basically expressed as an output P1 dB number in terms of watts. So, you know, well, one watt amplifier is about 30 dBm, half watt amplifier is about 27 dBm. So the wattage, when we talk about amplifiers, doesn't actually refer to um, the power consumption, it's the output power. And, you know, the relationship between uh, IP3 and the compression point so if we have this third order intercept, you know, the compression point actually follows much sooner than that does. And it's usually about 10 dB or um, more difference depending upon what's going on. So what we do, and we actually designed the, uh, so the math says it should be 10 dB. The uh, 
in reality, what we do when we design amplifiers is we actually put in extra circuitry to try and suppress these third order modulation products as well as we can. And we end up with about 20 dB of difference. And uh, you can think of kind of like back off from the output power uh, IP3, not back off from the, um, the P1 dB point when kind of selecting things. So cascaded IP3, because it's like I talked before, you know, each device has its own IP3. Uh, you want to be able to, cut the, what's going to end up dominating things is going to be the first device, and that's what you want to keep track of. So, you know, how does this affect like digital comms kinds of specifications? So if we have our, you know, um, our ACPR, our adjacent channel power ratio, or adjacent channel leakage ratio, or adjacent channel power. So if we look at this kind of uh, here, we have our adjacent channel, our main channel, another adjacent channel. We have uh, these numbers that are measured from our uh, rodent sorts equipment. Um, and as the, uh, the power in the channel goes up, it, it all looks fine until we get to a certain point where things actually start to bleed into the adjacent channel. And if that adjacent channel are the radio astronomy guys look where they're wanting to see down to that noise floor, you've just destroyed their measurements. Or if it's uh, somebody else who's paying for that spectrum, uh, they're gonna start complaining and you're gonna get um, uh, nasty uh, messages from, from people. And so if we kind of think of that, where's that coming from? If we kind of overlay our fundamentals and our IMDB products on here, we can kind of see it's the same exact kind of piece as it goes up. So we can actually, uh, you know, plot that and look at, you know, uh, the, the adjacent channel power kind of profiles as we uh, are on this side of the curve. It's kind of dominated by noise. If uh, this is down, it's just the noise floor, and it's just the ratio between peak and the noise, which uh, kind of drives down as the a signal amplitude goes up. And then as soon as the IP, or the, uh, the third order distortion products show up, then it's actually dominated by those things. And this is the way it works almost for every amplifier. And from a power consumption standpoint, um, you know, RF amplifiers are uh, not super efficient. Um, you know, a 100 milliamp amplifier with five, vol uh, five volts will consume basically half a watt and can get pretty warm. And uh, so this is actually uh, ACPR versus output power for a single carrier wide CDMA waveform. And we can see that actually it does make a difference between um, your output power between 3.3 uh, you know, volts and five volt supply. It kind of makes a difference. So from a noise perspective, you know, the output noise is always uh, basically the Johnson noise. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and noise is either specified as a noise figure or as a noise factor or spectral noise density or noise floor, um, noise spectral density. Uh, noise can be super confusing because um, lots of different people use lots of different units. And it's uh, sometimes difficult to go from one unit to the other unit, and different test manufacturers actually do their equipment a little differently as well. Um, and a lot of RF engineers actually fixate on noise even when like intermod products are actually a bigger problem. Uh, so cascaded noise performance, this is pr a pretty kind of standard piece where you want the noise figure of the first stage dominates that overall noise figure. Um, ADI actually makes a, like a noise figure uh, signal chain simulator, so you can actually stack up uh, the signal chain or transmit chain based on uh, different components and it will tell you what your uh, overall system chain is. And that's up on uh, analog.com slash ADI SIMRF. And this is just, uh, just a, a tool with a big um, uh, table behind it with all the data. Um, so you can kind of see in here this noise, distortion and noise contributes to the output spectral quality. So increasing your output power improves SNR, but if you increase it too much, then you end up with these third order modulation products showing up. And then, uh, like I said before, you got ACPR due to noise over here and ACPR due to AP IP3 over here. So in terms of uh, conclusions about just kind of amplifiers, 
You know, IP3 is super critical in performance. Um, you kind of have to watch out for that uh, when you're doing things. Uh, it's, uh, we use a lot of like wideband CDMA or LTE signals because they're nice and wideband and they're super um, industry standard and people kind of understand them really well. The you know, noise floor affects ACP at the various lower power levels. And uh, so some examples, so this is actually a, um, a connectorized module that analog devices makes, the uh, HMC7748. It's a two gig to six gig broadband amp like uh, 25 watt amplifier. So it has you know, uh, 28 volt supply inputs, uh, two SMA connectors, a 12 volt input, and an enable pin. And you get uh, 58 dB of gain. And it um, should only be used by people who know what they're doing because it's a 25 watt amplifier that will take anything, including third harmonics of your radio and uh, increase the, the, the signal by 58 dB, which is uh, pretty amazing. So you think of 58 dB, uh, 58, dB, 58 sounds like a small number, but when you take that and to actually translate it back to volts, it's basically um, almost 800 times the voltage. And if you think of that in watts, it's uh, 600,000 times the power output, which is uh, a pretty amazing feat. But you know, this amplifier, I think actually cons the power consumption of the amplifier, even though it's only putting out 25 watts, is almost 100 watts. So you need a four amp, 28 volt supply to power it. So uh, something a little more practical for people would be, um, uh, so, so this is nice in that it uh, has SMA connectors and has uh, uh, pins you can just connect to a bench supply. Um, for something a little more uh, usable for the average person, so this is a, um, a one watt amplifier, but it's available as most modern communication people need it. It's in a four millimeter by four millimeter package, which is pretty hard for uh, most people to get access to it. So uh, what we did is uh, we actually took this and put it on a small board with SMA connectors and a saw filter. So the soft filter ensures that you can connect it up to a standard SDR with maybe a bad um, harmonic, uh, or you know, third harmonic of the LO. You set it to 2.4, the, the third harmonic of the LO will be at uh, six, and it'll be suppressed to minus 70, and it shouldn't, shouldn't get out at all. And it, it gives you about 20 dB a gain. And it's, uh, it's pretty flat, so this is basically less than uh, one dB of uh, change in amplitude from 2.4 to 2.5, which is the spec of the saw filter. And if we look at the power number, the P1dB number of this little amplifier, it's, uh, it's uh, so this is, we increase the power from uh, minus 20 dB at the beginning to uh, 7 dBm at the output, or on this side of the graph, and we can see that it's dropped down about uh, one 1 dB by 5 dBm. So you can run, run the amplifier with no compression to about uh, 0 dBm. And so the P1 dB number is about 5.5 dB of input or about 25 dBm of output. And without any, that would be a compression of about a 1 dB. With no compression, you get about 0 dBm input which actually matches up pretty well with the, um, the Pluto SDR and I believe the B200 Mini and some, a lot of other kind of uh, SDR products. So if you want to get uh, you know, further across the room or you know, these kinds of things, it's pretty easy to do. So when we were talking to a lot of faculty who were using the Pluto SDR, they wanted to be able to broadcast a tone or, or a signal in a room like this and make sure that everybody in the room can handle it and just the output power of the device itself, you can't do that. And uh, so from a power perspective, um, there's no power from a bias T on the Pluto or a lot of the other devices in, the, in that kind of class, so we actually just powered it from um, a USB connector. So there's just a, a, U, a USB connector we just steal five volts from. Uh, we actually put it through a DC to DC supply, so it can be four and a half volts, it can be six volts, you can plug in your cell phone charger and it works fine. Um, and then put it through a little filter and then uh, generate our uh, known five volts out of here. But if you think of it from a power dBm perspective, we're putting out um, almost 20 dBm, which is about 100 milliwatts. You translate the volts, that's about 2.2 uh, volts RMS, or about six volts peak to peak. So 
if you're creating things with um, a five volt USB supply, how do you get six volts or even higher volts out of that? And the way it's done is kind of, like I said earlier, um, the output stage is actually connected to VCC through the, this inductor. So this is five volts over here. So from a DC perspective, this actually gets biased at five volts, the output stage. And what that allows is uh, it, the, from an AC perspective, I can go up five volts or down five volts. So I can actually have a 10 volt peak to peak swing on the output. And that's how you're ac actually able to get to do things. Um, and if we have, like um, hopefully some, everybody's somewhat familiar with this block diagram because it is the part that's in the, um, a lot of the NSB 200 radios and uh, the ADI Pluto and um, the, now the, the new one um, mini product. If you want, if there is an amplifier in there and you do want to still use this, you may want to decrease your output so that it can uh, not saturate. And uh, there'd be one of two ways to decrease the output. You could decrease the digital data going through the DACs, and that would be one way. But who can think why that would be a terrible way? Well, dynamic range, exactly. So the noise floor of the DACs and the, and the analog section here is always going to be the same. And if you decrease the digital input to the DACs, all you're doing is suppressing your signal, so your signal to noise ratio actually goes much lower. What you actually want to do is run your DACs actually as full scale as you can and change this attenuator at the end. That way you maximize your SNR. So um, there's an attenuator in the transmit section that allows you to actually have full scale through the DACs, through the mixers, and then decrease the attenuation so that uh, what comes out of the actual part or out of the SDR SMA connectors is actually less to maximize that SNR. And uh, so what we actually did was we uh, tested that. So, um, so this was a LTE uh, 10 signal. Um, and uh, so we basically tested things on this side with uh, no power amplifier. And uh, you measure the, uh, the, the output attenuator. That's what we're changing here. Measuring the output power, measuring the EVM. And you can see that as the, uh, the attenuator is increased, the signal to noise changes and your EVM gets a little worse until it gets better, and then you start getting dominated by uh, the intermod products. And then with the power amplifier at these same, same game settings, now we're, if we compare like zero dBm here, which was giving us about minus 34 uh, dBm out, average output power for the LTE signal, we were getting about minus 27 with about uh, 15, uh, an attenuation of minus 15, and we were getting uh, about a dB better, a one and a half dB better of EVM. And so you can actually see that this is actually increasing the gain and not negatively affecting the, um, the, the fidelity of the signal. So what that looks like in the real world is, uh, is kind of this. It's just a small, uh, small amplifier. Uh, you know, here's your input that you would connect right up to your radio. Uh, go, goes through your uh, saw filter, you know, uh, coupling capacitors, amplifier, output caps, right out to your antenna. And then this is just the uh, USB connector for um, the uh, power. And so uh, one of the things we found is it does get pretty hot. That's why we're doing actually a second spin of it. Um, and trying to make sure that it can uh, actually dissipate that power. Um, but spectra is a scarce resource that everybody needs to res respect. Just because you have a, um, an amplifier capable of, of sending out, uh, you know, uh, plus uh, 10 dB doesn't mean you should. Um, just because you are, just because you don't want to send a signal to anyone doesn't mean you aren't. So the, the RF spectre is a shared resource that everybody shares. It's not like Ethernet where if I, you're not on my Ethernet cable, you don't access my media. Um, and just because you don't want somebody to receive your signal doesn't mean they won't. And this can have like a large safety, security, economic impact as people, um, you know, the third harmonic of your system may interfere with somebody's uh, other system. And if that other system is, uh, you know, uh, PG&E's electrical um, maintenance system, you know, that's a big problem. 
So, um, you know, the FCC is local, but most countries have similar organizations because this is a large or can have large security and um, economic impacts. So in the US, the 2.4 to 2.48 range um, is described in a few FCC specs based on uh, if you're hopping, if you're not hopping, and how many hops you can do. Uh, we actually, when we test these radios out, uh, we actually test them in um, RF shielded rooms with uh, big doors on them to make sure that things can't leak. Um, if you can't afford that and are doing similar things, you can actually buy tents that are actually pretty good uh, to do similar kinds of things. Uh, but from a semiconductor supplier standpoint, you know, end users assemble intentional radiators and end users may need certification. Uh, if you're doing these kinds of things, you should absolutely get your ham license because I think that's actually the only way even um, to use an SDR, you're actually uh, legally obligated if you want to broadcast almost any power, you need, your, your, you need a license. Um, if you are contacted by the FCC or anyone else about using or uh, spectrum interference, stop using something. So my personal understanding of uh, part 15 is that uh, home-built and hobbyist kind of transmitters can be used, but cannot be offered for sale. And you can't market it. And uh, because one of the things is if the FCC determines that an operator has um, done dumb things or not used good engineering principles, they will uh, fine you uh, $10,000 a day, I believe is what it is. And, uh, and they do. There was recently um, a case where somebody was uh, reconfiguring some radios to do something they weren't supposed to and they were fined, um, I think it was, uh, it was over a few hundred thousand dollars. If you actually, if you want to look, you can go to um, FCC.gov slash enforcement and they actually put all their enforcement actions there. And uh, the willful, willful interference to communications is against the law. Um, it, you know, it's, uh, it can put you in jail depending upon what you're trying to do because it is, it's not just um, a violation of FCC rules, it's actually against the criminal code and uh, is uh, fraught with danger. So just because you have the possibility to have a, uh, um, a small little amplifier or you know, take out somebody's Wi-Fi because you think it'd be funny, yeah, it's not funny. Uh, so this is like the Bernie Sanders finger wagging at everybody. Um, but anyway, so uh, you know, there's lots of ways to use things. You can uh, do things uh, smart and, and, uh, and I, I think actually when it comes to the FCC pieces, um, the software defined radio community can actually work with the FCC in finding these things because I know that um, there are lots of stores, lots of restaurants that can, that have illegally imported cell phone jammers because they want to keep it a nice quiet setting. And uh, you know, finding those things with an SDR is actually very, very easy to do because you can see somebody's big CW and that's basically all these things do. So uh, thanks very much. If you have any questions, I'll uh, be at the, um, I'll be up here for a little bit and then uh, at the demo booth uh, later today. Thank you very much, Robin. Yeah.